Hi, I'm Cam Franklin here, a retired Coast Guard officer and SAMS accredited marine surveyor with over 40 years of experience in the maritime and diving industry. I've amassed literally thousands of photos of all the bad things I've found on boats during my career as a marine surveyor. So what we're going to do today is take a look at some of my favorites. We're going to take a look at each picture. We're going to discuss why they're evil. Evil! And we're going to discuss what you need to do to bring them. So hop in, buckle up, keep your arms and legs inside the car at all times as we take a carnival-like ride tour through the cavalcade of owner-induced perversions that I like to call Captain Frank's Sea Chest of Horror. Horror. Sea Chest of Horror. Horror. This plastic bait well pump is mounted directly to a bronze uh, seacock. Composite uh, fittings, you know, plastic, PVC, marlin, etc., to metal fittings or, or joints are bad things, particularly where seacocks and through holes below the waterline are concerned. Uh, metallic and composite components have different expansion and contraction ratios, which can result in uh, composite component failure due to cracks and splits. This is especially true in this case uh, because the pump acts as a lever uh, as the boat's pounding and bouncing around and it puts additional pressure on the fitting. A much better option would be to replace this with a bulkhead mounted pump and then plumb it to the through hole and seacock. Boaters are creative a lot when it comes to solving problems afloat. Not only is this homegrown connector slash junction splice that's used in the positive battery conductor non-standard to say the least, but it also leaves an energized bolt to arc and spark while bouncing around the engine compartment. And what's up with the, uh, the green wire connected to these red positive uh, wires? Collar codes? <laughs> we don't need to follow those things. So what we have here is not failure to communicate, it's your basic fire hazard. Cooling water is injected into the aft section of this exhaust riser where the hose is. However, between that point and the engine is a section of dry exhaust that gets extremely hot. This section of the riser should be lagged or wrapped with a suitable insulating material to prevent burns and protect equipment, such as the hose that's resting on it, uh, from damage. Uh, look closely and you'll also see that there are no stainless steel clamps holding the exhaust hose on the riser. Okay, so take a good look here at this photo. Uh, it provides a cornucopia of bad things that you'll find on boats. Uh, we're going to go over them one at a time and point them out to you. First up, the bilge pump is wired directly to the battery without the use of a fuse or circuit breaker for protection. Bilge pumps must always be protected by an appropriately sized fuse or circuit breaker. Also, the bilge pump wires are not properly secured. Wire runs should be secured and supported at least every 18 inches. Also, while the bilge pump has an automatic float switch, it does not have a manual on switch. Um, every bilge pump installation should always include a manual on and off switch in addition to any automatic float switches you may have. This allows the pump to be energized in the event that the float switch becomes inoperative. And while we're down here at the bilge pump, two other things that we don't like to see uh, twist on wire nuts and tape joints. The wire nut, it'll eventually fall off due to vibration. Uh, the tape, it'll eventually fall off, gets old and unravels. Uh, in both cases, they can leave exposed positive wires uh, that can provide a shock hazard or, you know, just arcing and sparking as they bounce around. Both of these wire connections should be made with proper marine grade connectors, preferably those with attached heat shrink tubing to prevent moisture entry and corrosion. Next, let's take a look at the battery. Uh, for one, uh, the battery itself is not secured properly. Um, per ABYC recommendations, batteries should be secured uh, so that there is no movement more than one inch in any direction. Uh, the other thing here is the positive terminal for the battery is not covered. Uh, again, standards require that the positive terminal for the battery be covered with a non-conductive shield uh, to prevent accidental shorting. This shield can be in the form of the rubber boots that you're familiar with, I'm sure. Uh, or it could also be if the battery box had a lid on it, that would suffice for it as well. We've also got the use of the evil wing nuts to make battery connections. Per ABYC, uh, American Boat and Yacht Council standards, 
Uh, battery cables and other conductors size 6 AWG and larger should not be connected to the battery with wing nuts. Uh, wing nuts are extremely difficult to properly torque and they typically work loose due to vessel movement and vibration. A better choice to secure battery cables and connections would be an appropriately sized stainless steel nylock nut. The question this uh, picture brings to mind is exactly how many wires can you connect to one battery post? Uh, more than you should, as this photo aptly illustrates, uh, ABYC recommendations uh, call for no more than four conductors to be secured to any one terminal stud. Uh, a better option here would be to relocate the connections to an appropriately sized fuse or breaker panel rather than wiring directly to the battery. While common sense dictates that, unlike shown in this photo, an AC power plug uh, has to be mounted, many do-it-yourselfers don't know that residential-style uh, copper wiring, the solid Romex stuff, is not recommended for use on board vessels. Solid wire is susceptible to breakage due to vibration, and that's the reason why marine-grade wire is always constructed of multi-stranded copper wire. Yes, we all know that battery switches need to be mounted, but does that mean the structure of the switch is mounted on has to be mounted as well? Isn't the intent of the requirement still met regardless? This is obviously the type of philosophical question this boat owner felt should be left up to someone else. Not only was the board that the battery switch was mounted on just loose and flopping around, the battery itself is not secured and it was flopping around too. In case you're wondering, this is what a properly mounted battery switch looks like. Here we have a hose clamp being used to secure a bonding wire to a seacock, an insulation that is as ineffective as it is unorthodox. While the pros and cons of having a bonding system installed are often debated, particularly among surveyors, one thing is certain. If you have one installed, all connections must be tight and corrosion free for the system to work properly. One that's uh, improperly installed or poorly maintained with a lot of corrosion on the connectors and stuff will provide the worst of both to bond or not to bond worlds. And yep, that seacock handle is looking pretty gnarly too, but that's a topic for another episode. When it comes to gasoline powered boats, if an electrical component or piece of equipment is installed in the engine compartment, fuel tank space, or a space containing gasoline fuel lines, then the electrical equipment must be labeled as being ignition protected. Ignition protected means that the electrical equipment will not cause an explosion by generating a spark if there are gasoline vapors present. As such, all starters, alternators, motors, circuit breakers, battery switches, electrical pumps, and the like must all be ignition protected and clearly labeled as such. Most of the problems I see with this are owner replaced items or new equipment installations. Common examples include replacement of a marine grade starter with an automotive unit or swapping out a marine grade water heater with a residential unit, neither of which are normally ignition protected. How do you know if a piece of electrical gear is ignition protected? It should be labeled as such. If not, you can contact the manufacturer for verification that it is ignition protected. Lacking this, we assume that it is not ignition protected and it cannot be used in a space that requires it to be. While all fuel tanks should be inspected regularly for signs of leaks or corrosion, this is particularly true for aluminum fuel tanks installed below cockpit decks or open style vessels, center consoles, walk around cuddy cabins, and so forth. Such installations are especially prone to corrosion when water drips onto the top of the tank, often due to leaking cockpit deck inspection ports. A lot of times these uh, ports will have little O-rings in them and those O-rings will get dirty or broken uh, and they'll be missing when I do a survey or they'll just be nasty and they leak. In the photos you're seeing here, water has combined with deck washed down dirt and debris to form a gooey slurry that creates a perfect storm of corrosion potential. Corrosion issues can also arise when the aluminum tank is foamed into place during boat construction. The foam often retains moisture, which then rests against the tank, promoting corrosion. 
Corrosion can also occur if the tank bottom has inadequate bilge clearance and often rests in bilge water. The estimated service life for an aluminum fuel tank in an open cockpit type boat is around 20 years. So if you're contemplating buying a boat of that type and it has an aluminum fuel tank in it, uh, there's a couple of things you need to do. One is you need to look at access. Can you access the fuel tank without cutting the decks open to get to it? That will be a major concern because cutting decks and cheap are never really used in the same sentence. Uh, the other thing you want to think about too is if you buy an older boat and it has an aluminum fuel tank, an open cockpit boat, I'd recommend that you set up an escrow account. In other words, you're going to put a little bit of money uh, aside each month so that when that tank eventually needs to be replaced, you'll have that pot of money uh, to draw from and pay for it. So take a good look at this photo here. You've got a uh, deck fill that's labeled diesel and you've got a lid for it or a cap for it that's labeled water. Sure, you may know if it's water or fuel, but what about the kid down at the fuel dock or thirsty cousin Joe down from Milwaukee trying to fill the water tank? A mistake either way will be a costly lesson as to why all tank fills must be properly labeled. With the increased demand to have all the electrically powered doodads and comforts of home on board, it should come as no surprise that the most common source of AC-related fires on board involve overheated shore power cords, plugs, and receptacles. Barring improper use or some owner-induced MacGyverism gone bad, such as a jury rig adapter or botched plug installation, looseness and corrosion are the primary causes of shore power system fires. The charring is a result of heat buildup due to resistance of dirty contacts, poor connections, corrosion, and looseness, which generates heat and the potential for fire. The problem is especially prevalent among liveaboards, who tend to continually run high energy loads such as water heaters, air conditioning, and electric heaters. The good news is that such problems rarely occur overnight, instead starting out small and getting progressively worse, giving you plenty of time to take corrective action. Taking an extra 10 seconds to inspect your AC shore power plugs and inlets for problems monthly or each time you disconnect them, such as when you're preparing to leave the dock, can enable you to head off major damage before it occurs. Uh, what you want to do is look for discoloration, which is an indication of overheating, or corrosion on or around the pins and plug inlets. Another good practice is checking the feel for the connection when plugging it in. Those that feel loose or don't seem to make firm mechanical contact likely won't provide good electrical contact either. And here's another uh, tech and safety tip. If you find a plug that's burnt or charred, don't just replace that. Check the inlet uh, to see if it's burnt as well and vice versa. So what we see here is the water line for a mid-sized fishing vessel. Uh, if you take a look at where the water line is, uh, the one thing you'll notice here is that the cockpit scupper drains, which are the two drains shown here, are below the static resting water line of the hull. Now what that means is that if this boat, uh, if it's in the water, you leave it at the dock or something, uh, or you store it in the water in a slip, uh, the cockpit drains are below the water line. That means that if it, you have a heavy rain or, or water is introduced into the boat, uh, this drains will not drain properly, which could then lead to uh, sink another vessel. The reason these cockpit scuppers are below the static water line of the vessel, uh, they were not originally uh, below the static water line of the vessel when it was, uh, came from the manufacturer. Uh, however, now it is, and the reason they are is because the owner... Uh, upgraded his engine, and when he did so, he put a newer, uh, larger engine uh, with uh, more horsepower, but it was also a lot heavier than the older engine. More weight on the transom or at the stern means that the uh, the boat is going to float lower in the water, which means uh, the static water line is going to be higher. And when it's higher, it goes above the uh, scupper drains, and that's why they're below the, the water line. So here we have another example of AC shore power uh, plug and inlet charring. Uh, this is a particularly bad case, but it is certainly not unusual. 
And by that, I mean probably a good 10 to 15 percent of the, the boats that I survey with AC shore power systems uh, exhibit some form of uh, heat buildup in the form of browning around the pins uh, or the inlet or the shore power plug itself or charring. Uh, what causes this? Well, the boats that typically have it are what I call high amperage boats, boats that have uh, systems on board that draw a lot of amperage. This includes uh, air conditioning systems, uh, water heaters, uh, electric heaters. You know, probably some of the worst offenders on with this regard are liveaboards. Uh, they live aboard all year round, and they they run air conditioners all in the summer, and they run heaters in the winter, and they use water heaters all the time. This is a lot of amperage to draw through these plugs. And what actually causes the charring and stuff is uh, when you have, uh, if you let's say, for example, if you unplug these plugs while there's power to them, you have little micro arcs and sparks. Or if the plugs are plugged in, but they're not tightened, and they can loosen or move as the boat moves around, the plug and connection kind of wiggles around a little bit. All these little micro arcs and sparks uh, and generate pitting on the, the pins and plugs, which in turn leads to uh, resistance and heat buildup. This uh, gets worse over time. Uh, the more arcing, the more sparking, the more pitting, the more charring, and it kind of snowballs to eventually you get the burning and charring that you see in this photo. This situation right here is probably the number one cause of AC power related uh, fires on board a vessel. And another thing I'll point out, if you look at that picture, you'll see that the retaining ring is missing from that plug. And it's that uh, retaining ring that once the, the plug is inserted into the inlet, it's that retaining ring that allows you to, to tighten it up uh, by threading it onto the, the fitting there and, and snugging it up to prevent a lot of that excess moving, which could be uh, one of the reasons that this plug is uh, charred. Here is a good example of not having uh, adequate cathodic protection. Uh, you can see here that the shaft where it joins into the propeller hub has been significantly reduced in uh, diameter due to corrosion. It's probably lost a good 5 to 10% of its overall diameter. And the cause of this is inadequate uh, cathodic protection in the form of sacrificial anodes. A common name for sacrificial anodes are zincs. However, that is a misleading term because not all sacrificial anodes are zincs. Some of them are made of aluminum or magnesium. And the type of sacrificial anode you'll be using is going to be based on the water. Is it salt water? Is it fresh water? Is it brackish water? This would determine the type of sacrificial anode that you would install. So this picture tells an interesting story. Um, this was a survey on a mid-sized uh, sport fisherman, around 36 foot, and it had a flying bridge uh, helm. And when I arrived to do the survey, this what you see in the picture here is brown running juice, uh, trawler juice is what we call it. It's uh, an indication of uh, core deterioration and uh, delamination and rot. Water's gotten into the core and somewhere. Well, when I first arrived, this was not present. And once we took the boat out and did a sea trial and got up on a plane and rode around, I noticed this stuff was pouring out of the flying bridge uh, deck or the coach roof of the main cabin. So once we got underway uh, and it started angling the boat up, this uh, brown liquid started pouring out of the flying bridge uh, deck and of course upon tapping it and stuff I discovered that it was soft and delaminated and had extreme moisture intrusion uh, and rot. While dripless shaft seals such as the PYI PSS uh, seal shown here uh, do not require uh, repacking like a stuffing box does they still have regularly scheduled inspection and maintenance requirements. PYI recommends that the bellows be replaced every six years, along with the O-rings, set screws, and stuff in the uh, stainless steel rotor and hose clamps. Unlike a traditional stuffing box, your PSS shaft seal should never leak, which is evident in this photo along with the rust and corrosion. The most common cause of minor leaking is the presence of foreign material between the stainless steel rotor and carbon flange. Even a single grain of sand or a blade of grass can break this seal, resulting in drips and leaks. Additional problems shown here include corroded hose clamps, 
both at each end of the bellows and at the cooling water hose connection, which is plumbed to the engine raw water cooling system. The cooling water hose itself shows signs of age and deterioration uh, as shown in the red circle and should also be inspected and replaced at regular intervals, such as when the bellows is replaced. So what you see here is the top of an aluminum fuel tank in a uh, mid-sized open cockpit style center console fishing vessel. The problem with these vessels uh, from a fuel tank standpoint is that, uh, you know, you always have water kind of on the decks, either from, you know, spray or rain or when you're washing it down. And if the openings or the, you know, deck, deck access ports to the fuel tank are not uh, properly sealed, in other words, the gaskets are missing or they're broke or deteriorated, then you have water leaking down onto the top of the fuel tank and you also get the, the stuff from the cockpit deck, you know, slurry, fish, guts, whatever you have. And it all sits right on top of the fuel tank. And it just generates this perfect storm of corrosion. This goo that you see right here is a result of all that leaking down onto the, the fuel tank. Open cockpit style boats, you have an aluminum fuel tank. The lifespan on these things is about 20, 25 years. So if you purchase a boat like this that has a open cockpit, uh, what you want to do is make sure that you have access to the fuel tank so that you, uh, when you eventually have to replace it, you can get to it without opening up the decks. Uh, when I say open up, I mean cut and open the decks. In the meantime, always make sure that your, your openings, your, your deck access plates or panels uh, are properly sealed and that the O-rings are in place and in good condition. If your cockpit uh, deck has removable panels or plates, uh, these should also be periodically removed, eh, maybe every five to seven years, so that you can not only check the fuel tank, but you also can renew the caulking around the cockpit deck panel to ensure that it's uh, not allowing water to leak onto the fuel tank. I always check flares, emergency signaling devices, uh, flare guns, etc. as part of a typical survey. And one of the things I sometimes find with older flare guns, uh, some of the older plastic flare guns by Olin, uh, which is now Orion Safety Products, they can't be opened wide enough to accept a flare cartridge and would therefore be useless in the event of an emergency. The problem is the nylon material used to keep the breech closed can swell or deform and jam the opening mechanism. Uh, any Olin plastic flare gun is suspect, uh, as are Orion guns made before 2000, which is the year that the mechanism was re-engineered. Uh, guns with the modification have the U.S. Coast Guard approval code uh, 160028-12-1 stamped uh, on the body of the gun. Orion has agreed to replace any of these defective guns regardless of age, so they should uh, uh, be sent to the manufacturer for replacement and you get a new gun. Uh, they also recommend checking the operation of the guns now and at the beginning of every season. If the breach won't open, the gun should be sent back for replacement as discussed. They can be returned to the manufacturer at the address shown above. So what you're looking at here are hoses uh, for a fuel tank fill and a freshwater tank fill on an older Taiwanese uh, sailboat. I think it was a late 70s vintage. Anyway, the fuel hose fill is to the left, uh, the freshwater fill is to the right, and it shows where the hoses are connected to the deck fills. Uh, as you can see, these hoses are well past their service life. Their original hose is probably 30 plus years old. And the stainless steel hose clamps are badly corroded. You couldn't access these fills without removing the panel, which was glued down. And this is part of a, a subsequent uh, item that following a survey that I did on the boat, a pre-purchase survey. So once they opened up the, uh, the panel, I went back and took a look. And this is what you see, old hoses, the hose clamps uh, just crumbled to dust when you touched them. So the lesson to be learned here is if you have uh, equipment that you cannot access for inspection, you need to open that stuff up and take a look at what's going on in there. And this is a prime example of it.